My name is Mark Cohen. I teach at the MRED Plus U program. And I know real estate people love to talk. But let's see if we can give our next 15 minutes to the students who we have assembled up here on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our sixth annual research survey. We began this six years ago, measuring your audience response and sentiment to the market conditions here in South Florida. This year, we have a great student team, but first, before I introduce them, I'd like to introduce some of the others who helped us. Over actually here on my right-hand side is Leslie Burns. She is the business advisor, a member of the Emerald Plus U board, and helped us immensely. She's with John Burns Real Estate Consulting, and she and her crew have helped to guide the students with their assessment and how to conduct the survey. Also, I want to make a call out to Dr. Chuck Cole, who you've met before. He's the head of the MRED program. He and Professor Tim Hernandez also were on our advisory team, and I was the lead faculty advisor. So our team today is eight students, all of them graduate students in the MRED Plus U program. They're wonderful at not only what they do, but really they're the future leaders in real estate. And I look forward to hearing what they have to say, in fact, as a response to your responses to our survey. So let's kick off this afternoon. We actually have two key parts to our survey. As always, we're going to give you a sentiment survey, some market responses to how you think the market is working here in our South Florida economy. And then we will switch to the key pillars that the students have put together. In fact, what they think are the issues that are important today and the core of our survey, and then we'll wrap up with our takeaways. So let me start off and introduce Mike Lombard to my left. He's going to start and tell us what your responses were for our market sentiment survey. Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Optimism is surging here in South Florida. That's right. A whopping 19% more respondents see expansion potential in Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties compared to last year. Additionally, the session fears have nosedived. 202% showing a growing resilience in the region. Across all asset classes, valuations continue to reflect 2023. However, there are two sectors moving into the past neutrality. Hospitality has swung about 28% since the season, as well as retail selling with a 25% jump in neutrality, suggesting potential search for the future of retail. Here's another example from last week. So far, we have seen that assumptions remain as holding all these asset classes, yet there are exciting shifts brewing. 34% of professionals plan to sell office properties. However, the real interest is in industrial and multifamily. Buying intentions in these two sectors have surged with a 44% increase in industrial and a 30% increase in multifamily. The rising interest in acquiring these assets is undeniable and investors are taking notice. Great. Thanks, Mike. Now we'll turn to Richard Woods, who will continue our discussion of your responses to the market survey. Thank you, Professor Crown. Access to debt and equity remains a top story. As 75% respondents, 75 of respondents indicated that this is a significant impact on investment opportunities. It should also be noted that this is the only factor that increased in 2023 and 2024 regarding a significant impact. When we look at a decrease, uh, we see that of uh, expected population growth. That decreased by almost 40% since last year. Little change regarding factors of attraction to South Florida. Uh, we look at ROI as our first topic. We see a decrease, a, de a decreased trend from 2020 uh, going marginally. When we switch to expected population growth, we see an even more downward trend from 2023 to 2024 of 20%. Demand outpacing supply leads to current expectations. Our respondents are hopeful of swift absorption throughout asset classes. We also looked at low interest rates and stable construction costs as this changed from least likely to likely. This was a 70% increase from 2023. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Now let's dive into what's really happening here in the South Florida world. Now this is a photo really of the expected and anticipated developments just in Miami alone in the next three years. As you can see, South Florida is transforming not only in Miami, 
but in all of our major urban cores and metropolitan centers. Now, today, the students actually asked you, the respondents, to focus on what we call the five pillars, housing, education, accessibility, transportation, and technology. And with apologies to Miami Heat, they came up with this logo too as well. So let's dive into this, and now let's go to David Flaxer, who will introduce the housing pillar. Thank you, Professor. Given the unprecedented annual increases in average rents and home values in South Florida, exacerbated by the pandemic, astute investors have recognized the dire need for more affordable housing as evidenced by some high quality projects that have recently delivered by the likes of related urban groups, HPG and MRK. But despite a recent RFP put out by Miami-Dade County in which multiple developers have proposed upwards of 5,000 additional affordable units in our market, it simply just represents a drop in the bucket compared to the actual need. As such, many South Florida families are now faced with a new reality that they may, need, they may need to uproot themselves and move to other parts of the state or country where the cost of living is cheaper. So how do we stop a looming recession? How do we make South Florida more affordable for everyone? To get some answers, we started by asking survey respondents whether they felt Senate Bill 102, the Live Local Act, is in fact an effective tool to improve affordability in South Florida. As you can see from the results, the majority of respondents do think that SB 102 is effective. That said, as we know, multiple projects that have been proposed recently have been met with at best mixed sentiment from the public in respective municipalities. To that end, our team is actively tracking current bill that has just passed the Senate, SB 328, which proposes a number of amendments to fine tune SB 102. We then went on to ask survey respondents to rank a number of key factors in order of impact to addressing housing affordability. Increasing the overall housing supply came, yielded the strongest results at 35%, followed by increasing public-private partnerships. Surprisingly, transit-oriented development, TODs, garnered a lackluster response, which may indicate that survey respondents don't necessarily associate TODs as affordable places to live. Great, thank you very much, David. Now let's go to Tara Patel, who will discuss the education pillar. Thank you, Professor. Education is the foundation of personal growth and social mobility. It equips individuals with the knowledge and skills such as critical thinking, creativity, and problem-solving ability to navigate to the complexities of life and work. In South Florida, the University of Miami, Florida International University, Nova Southeastern, and Florida Atlantic University are, uh, are examples of, a few of institutions that nurture these skills and help launch the careers of individuals. So we ask the commercial real estate industry, what did they want most from universities? They responded by saying they needed a skilled workforce in commercial real estate as well as a skilled workforce in industry support in technology and finance and other fields. The team was then curious about what made the strongest employees or colleagues. 50% of the respondents mentioned that relevant work experience was the most important factor followed by trainability and interpersonal skills. The level of education and the knowledge of the local market were of lower importance. Great, thank you very much, Tara. Now let's move on to Daniel Rodriguez, who will address the accessibility pillar. Thank you, Professor. In order for a great metropolis to thrive, every citizen must play a part. Marginalizing any group severely disrupts the balance. Encouraging developers to create accessible environments is essential. Access to innovation, increased workforce participation, and the broader consumer base. Facing an aging population, Singapore understood that maximizing accessibility was in everyone's best interest. They implemented a universal barrier-free accessibility code, setting a global standard. Singapore's code doesn't only target people in wheelchairs, it targets people of all ages and all disabilities. Singapore's strategy exemplifies how government initiatives 
can inspire private corporations to follow. Back in the U.S., 26% of people live with a disability, yet less than 6% of the national housing supply is available to us. In Florida, the number is even worse. 11.8% of people report having a mobility impairment, and less than 1% of housing is wheelchair accessible. These numbers signify that there is a great oversight in our local housing policy. Our survey concludes that in order to break the accessible, the accessible housing shortage, there needs to be a strategic alignment of interest of developers and getting an incentive. South Florida is a prime destination for people with disabilities. Thanks to its flat geography, warm climate, youthful demographics, and low taxes, it's very desired. In order to identify what the most relevant incentives were, we asked our respondents to rank them from one to five. Coming in at number one was an additional 30% of life credit, followed by the ability to impose a 5% retrograde to able-bodied tenants occupying accessible units. Finally, a streamlined approval process. By bridging this divide, we can unlock the new market demographic and make South Florida a better place. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Daniel. Now let's move on to Stephanie Bannon, and she's gonna to talk to us about the transportation pillar. Thank you, Professor. For our fourth pillar, transportation, our survey gained valuable insights specifically looking at transit-oriented development. Transit-oriented development, or TODs, have the ability to transform a city from a moment to a movement through sustainable and interconnected urban growth. So TODs offer affordable housing, which contributes to social equity. It stimulates economic growth by driving investment and businesses to the area. With ease of access, to public transportation, reduce dependencies on cars, offers um, environmental sustainability, as well as the mixed use spaces, offers a sense of community. For our first sur survey question, we had an overwhelming 94% of respondents say that access to public transportation is vital for TODs in the area. For our next survey question, respondents were asked to, to rank the attributes most likely to promote TODs in South Florida. Government incentives were believed to be the greatest catalyst for TODs in our area. Great, thanks very much, Stephanie. And now let's turn to the last pillar where Tyler James is going to talk to us about technology. Professor, thank you. The whole world is talking about artificial intelligence. In fact, when we were in Los Angeles last fall for the ULI conference, it was the main topic of the keynote address. This image you see right here, our team generated in three seconds. And it's a great example of the use of this new technology. So we wanted to know, what do you think about this? What advantages could AI have to the real estate market here in South Florida? So while the general public is pretty much split on whether AI is a good thing or a bad thing, our respondents were not split at all. The overwhelming majority thinks it carries more benefits than challenges. Our team came up with five of those potential benefits, and we asked the respondents to rank them from one to five, which ones would be most likely to be positively impacted by AI. Streamlined permitting processes and additional cost savings came one and two. The key takeaway here is that our respondents believe that not only can AI potentially save you time, but most importantly, it's going to save you money as well. Great, thanks so much, Tyler. And now we turn to Juan Pablo Gutierrez, who will summarize today's session and tell us about the key takeaways. Thank you, Professor. So here are the key takeaways from our presentation. The market cycle sentiment went from a fear or recession to a sentiment of expansion. In terms of strategy, the market went from buying to holding position, and the, ah, sorry, <laughs> and return of expectation went from asset appreciation and exit to demand outpacing the supply. Now, back to our five pillars. What should South Florida do next for each of the pillars? For the housing pillar, South Florida should keep on utilizing the list local acts public and private partnerships to increase supply. For the education pillar, South Florida and universities in South Florida should keep on providing professionals that are specialized in commercial real estate. For the accessibility pillar, South Florida should keep on incentivizing and promoting accessible and universal design for all development. For the transportation pillar, South Florida and the market should keep on entrusting and using the already in place government incentives to increase the amount of TOD. And last, for the technology pillar, 
South Florida and the market believe that artificial intelligence should be integrated within development and operational processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Pablo. And now, here's our final slide. In fact, I encourage everybody to aim their cameras for the QR code. This gives you the opportunity to download today's presentation and also to register for the full report, which will be uploaded to our website. So let's give a big round of applause to this great team here for their work. So thank you, and I'm now going to turn it over to Tom Nealon of the Law School, and he'll introduce the next session.